Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I think it's re I think it's really great that we have such a wonderful community that it that it's hard to uh, it's hard to get quiet. <laughs> Welcome to uh, the 2019 State of the Department address. Uh, and uh, as I think of it, this is the 89th year of the department. The department was uh, founded in 1930, so next year will be our 90th anniversary. Um, and, uh, but I'm, I'm really thrilled to, that all of you have come. And I want to remind everybody that following Grand Rounds, we'll, we will be taking our once in a decade <laughs> picture uh, in front of CMHC, and you're all, I hope all of you will stay and be a part of the, be part of the picture. Um, as I always do, let me disclose my conflicts of interest, the most exciting part of my presentation. I have a consult to a variety of pharmaceutical companies. Um, I have stock in a couple of companies, uh, most importantly, Biohaven Medical Sciences, which is a pharmaceutical company, and patents that I've been a part of have been licensed by Janssen and a few other companies. Uh, those are all the companies I've consulted to. So this is my 10th anniversary as chair of the Department of Psychiatry. So. Uh, And, and your 10th anniversary of having me as chair of the Department of Psychiatry. So, so congratulations to all of us. Uh, uh, so, so, so where are we? And, and uh, uh, we, you know, we face a number of challenges in psychiatry. We always have and, and perhaps we always will. There is stigmatization, stigmatization of our patients and of our profession. We face challenges with the reimbursement for the clinical care that we give, and that constrains the access uh, uh, that people have to effective treatment. Um, and, and we know that we want everybody screened, and we know that we want everybody get a, to get treatment, but the, the cost that that would uh, uh, incur has been daunting for uh, society, for, for large-scale organizations and for society and uh, has undermined the effort to, uh, to reduce the burden of mental illness in society. Um, worst of all, mental illness is the only medical disorder that is criminalized. If you develop a drug addiction, you can go to jail. If you be misbehave in society because of your mental illness, you can go to jail. And the effort to decriminalize psychiatric pathology um, is, uh, has uh, had a long Home in this department is something that I'm very proud of uh, that we do. In, er in all the work that we undertake, we face work face uh, workforce shortages and lack of diversity. And this is really uh, uh, important to us because it, it undermines um, our ability to meet the needs of society uh, and it limits the quality of our community and the work that we do. Um, we face the limited efficacy of our treatments. Our treatments are palliative. In other words, they are not curative, but they reduce the symptoms, generally speaking. Uh, they are inefficient. Um, and, and for many patients, having mental illness means having a lifelong challenge, uh, that uh, lifelong struggle. And there's so much that we don't know. There's so much that we don't know about the causes of the illnesses how these illnesses work in the brain, how we can better understand the psychological impact of these illnesses, and how, how we can reduce the suffering and disability um, that these illnesses and problems cause. And, and one of the reasons that our, su our, our knowledge base is so superficial is that the funding for research on, on mental illness doesn't keep up with the magnitude of the problem. So uh, we have, we, if you think about the depth of knowledge that we have about uh, of the treatments for psychiatric disorders, that pales compared to the depth of knowledge that we have about, say, cancer. And that's partly because the much greater funding for cancer research has at least 
let the field understand the impact of various combinations of various forms of treatment so that they have a better understanding about the impact of their armamentarium, whereas society devolves uh, decisions about optimized treatment, say with medications, to the individual doctor trying to figure out what combinations work best for their individual patient, which is, which is a really challenging and uncertain process which we call the art of psychiatry. So, so the needs are clear in some ways, not so complicated. We need universal screening. We need universal access to effective treatment, particularly addressing the disparities in the access to effective treatment. We need better strategies to support adherence, engagement, and rehabilitative treatments, and better great integration of our treatment modalities, psychotherapy and medication treatments in the ambulatory, intensive outpatient, inpatient phases. Uh, it, it, there's much, much to fragmentation. And of course, we need more effective treatments and a larger and better trained overall workforce. So we could just like toss in the towel, go home, take our picture now, go have lunch. Uh, <laughs> But the reality is that, that if you had to face all of, these no, you know, all of these challenges, there is no place I'd rather be than right here. And that's because we have an incredible faculty who are leading the effort to, to have uh, an impact on this, to change the status quo. We have unbelievably wonderful trainees who care about the problems that we're dealing with and who will become the leaders of tomorrow. We have an amazing staff who tolerate the foibles of the faculty and trainees and, and, and make sure that the work that needs to get done can get done. And, and overall, we've worked very hard over the past 10 years to strengthen, reinforce, uh, and deal with the issues of our community so that we really are, are are, have become much more of a community that can support each other, that can include each other, that, that cares about the, the efforts that everybody uh, is doing, and enable us to focus on, on our mission. I'm just looking, there are some purple chairs down here, a couple of chairs. Please, uh, we can, we can uh, 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 set, set that up, and there are a couple of uh, open seats as well that we can focus on the one thing that we're all trying to do, which is the one thing that I think all departments of psychiatry should do, which is to focus on alleviating the burden of mental illness. But because the challenges are so complex, we need all of the components of our mission in order to achieve the same. The ability to give in innovative care to patients, uh, to translate our academic advances to clinical advances and to take advantage of the expertise and experience of our, of our faculty, um, to train the next generation of leaders both by recruiting the best. I've always found that the best way to look like a great mentor is to recruit an incredibly talented trainee. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but, but, but to, give, to give people opportunities to give them the nurturing that they need, the support, the guidance, and then get out of their way. Um, and then to generate the break, breakthroughs that really transform the, form the field. You know, the, um, as I think about our department and our efforts to achieve the, uh, the aim that we all strive for, I keep coming back to this um, speech by, by uh, President Kennedy, um, which which uh, has inspired me for a long time, and, and I actually read, read this in my uh, installation presentation uh, 10 years ago, which was about why Kennedy wanted the country to focus on going to the moon. And he said, we chose to go to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. And I think that epitomizes what I think about our department. We are in it for the long run. We will do the hard work, um, and we will uh, prevail. 
And I recently heard another, uh, uh, Tom Insel referred to Bill Gates in this talk uh, about, about the experience I think that we all have, which is that, that when, we, when we think day to day about what's the change, the change seems so slow. But if you look back over the last decade, change seems so fast. And, and Bill Gates says that we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years, but underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. And I think this has been certainly my experience over the last decade. And I thought I would look back uh, uh, in, in the talk today at, at a couple of times to, to think about some of the things that just really are <laughs> shocking in a way about progress that we've made in the field and, and, uh, and um, and in the department. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about transformative trends, about honors and transitions in the department, and then just make a few summing up, uh, uh, summing up uh, comments. So the, perhaps the greatest, most powerful transformative trends, uh, trend in society is the way in which people communicate and get information and use information. Um, both through their computers, through their uh, telephones, and nowadays through wearable devices, which communicate with the other two and, and which can perform all kinds of things. And, and I think many of us thought that when uh, groups started to use web-based tools that they would rapidly uh, uh, be incorporated into uh, all the work that we do because many people believe, and I, 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 pr I probably am one of them, that, that psychiatry, psychology, mental health will be one of the fields where these technologies um, uh, uh, are most informative. Because people, for example, let's start at the wearable devices, they can wear things and collect data so that you, they can keep you, these devices can keep you informed about the activities and well-being of your patients without even, without even them, need, pe them needing to call you. People want to be able to communicate about their distress when the distress occurs. And they want to get their treatment in a setting, in a way that they want. And they want the treatment that they get to be tailored to them. And all of those things are possible with these new technologies in ways that, that, that are even difficult uh, for me to imagine or, 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 uh, or uh, uh, understand, really. So some of the opportunities through these technologies are that we may have, at some point, biomarkers and outcome mon monitoring in a way that we haven't. And, and the idea that we could use data to tell us about how effective our treatments are and then hold our, our systems of care accountable for the effectiveness of mental health interventions, that's something that we've never done. Um, but I believe essential for ultimately um, ultimately transforming the quality and, imp and effectiveness of, of mental health treatment. Secondly, these technologies offer you large-scale, low-cost, flexible uh, access to treatment. And so if we, meet, if we want to meet the true need, mental health needs of society, we have to incorporate these technologies because they are a way of expanding, and increase, expanding access and increasing the efi efficiency of treatment. Um, they offer ways to monitor and support re real world and adherence and engagement in treatment to improve outcomes. And there are tremendous opportunities to personalize both our understanding of the impact of illness and the interventions. And one of the really interesting things is that, that uh, the uptake of these technologies is really inhomogeneous. So that there are already many companies that are are providing access to these sorts of treatments in support of uh, mental health interventions, uh, mental uh, iPhone uh, counseling, telemedicine, uh, things like that. Um, and and they're, up, they're, there's, they're very popular and they're rapidly uptake, uh, uptake, taken up by parts of, parts of society, such as by millennials. There are many challenges, though. Um, one of the problems is that is that engagement with these technologies often needs to be supported um, just by in face-to-face in -face or other kinds of social interactions to improve the engagement and adherence to, uh, to various forms of, of uh, 
uh, of technologic treatments. Otherwise, people just sort of blip onto the, onto the page and blip off. And we heard a lot about this from the grand rounds of John Torres, who was here not too long ago. There are concerns about autonomy and privacy. I think I don't need to go in this detail. We all know that, that there are groups that would like to be able to harness the data that is generated through these kinds of things to market other kinds of products and to make money. Um, the, the use of digital technologies, particularly passive data technologies, has proven to be much more challenging, complicated, because the signal-to-noise properties of, of data generated and walk when you walk around or use your iPhone, it's much noisier than people thought. And there are many unexpected confounds, and so progress is, is, is slower than expected uh, given the technological advances. And um, one of, another property is that it seems like many established healthcare systems, for example, Yale New Haven Hospital or Yale School of Medicine, are really struggling um, to figure out how to adapt these technologies in support of care given the kind of scale and bureaucracy associated with running such large clinical enterprises. Um, and so one of the consequences is that innovation is often outside of the traditional healthcare system. So you have telemental health startup companies which are doing the work of providing health care to populations that might have otherwise been um, cared for using, uh, using um, standard, uh, you know, through their standard uh, health care systems. And there are a variety of technology companies, big, big companies that have a lot of money to invest, like Google and, and Amazon and others that, that are interested. Another interesting thing is that con individual consumers are making their own choices about whether to be part of these kind of digital waves. So they're signing up on their own for access, even if they have insurance or other kinds of more traditional ways of supporting their treatment. And as I mentioned earlier, there are general ge generational differences. One of the consequences is, as I alluded to, um, that Amazon and Apple and, um, and Google are experimenting with setting up their own healthcare systems. So what would it mean if Google had clinics and digital technologies and, 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 and designed whole new kinds of, of clinical enterprises entirely integrating all the technology advances that, that Google could bring to bear uh, in, in terms of healthcare and, com and, and they did it outside of the traditional healthcare system. I don't really have an answer to that, but I think Google has a lot more money than like Yale or Yale, uh, you know, Haven Hospital. So the pace of innovation and the scaling of implementation could be a major kind of challenge, M maybe not a bad challenge, maybe a positive in a positive way, but a major challenge for healthcare nationally. And there are beginning to be some very interesting trends of the outside, in other words, the tech world, moving inward. So, so Tom Insel, who was the director of NIMH and then head of Verily, which was Google's life science division, and then um, one of the founders of MindStrong, a, a passive data technology company, is now the mental health czar. I wonder what a czar is. I mean, I have this image, Im you know, I, uh, like, is that like Tsar Nicholas uh, of Russia? I don't know. But he is now uh, officially a czar uh, for mental health uh, for the state of California and is uh, working very closely with Bill Newsom to, to, uh, to structure the mental health services provided by the state of California. So think of it. A guy who's who hasn't worked in psychiatry, hasn't treated patients, hasn't worked in a healthcare system in the private sector ever in his career, um, who is a really smart researcher who left a career in research to become a research administrator um, and then work in the tech industry, he's going to tell the governor of California how to organize health system. And this could be transformationally wonderful. I mean, Tom is an incredibly thoughtful and smart guy, but it's really a different way. Uh, this is a really different voice that's shaping the direction of healthcare in California. And 
And one of the really interesting things which we often forget in terms of, of um, technology, uh, which is that many of the people that we, that we work with, they are disenfranchised and disconnected in many ways, but sometimes they're very well connected uh, technologically. Uh, and these are just examples of, of homeless people um, finding ways to support their, their, uh, their uh, technology access. So something is happening. And, and over the next couple of years, I don't think you're going to see much change, but over the next 10 years, there's going to be a revolution, and we don't really know what, it, what it's going to look like, but we're all going to be a part of it, and, and it, will, it may change the way that we do business. Okay, so let's talk about drugs. So the field of psychopharmacology, uh, I would say, is, is older uh, than most of the people in this room. Uh, there are a few people in the room that are, are, uh, uh, are older than psychopharmacology, and, and you know who you are. I'm not going to point <laughs> you out. Uh, uh, so, um, so what about drugs? So lithium was discovered in 1949. Antipsychotic medications that block serotonin and dopamine receptors were discovered in 1953. Our, our main classes of, of, uh, of uh, antidepressants, drugs affecting monoamine metabolism and drugs blocking transporters like SSRIs, uh, tricyclics, all of that goes back to 1957. So all the main classes of drugs that we use in psychiatry were discovered by 1957 which is, by my account, 62 years ago, right? That's a long time. So, so we all know, and you, you probably know where I'm going with this, because there's, you know, it's become an adage that in every grand round, someone has to use the word ketamine <laughs> uh, at Yale. Uh, so, but it's really, this department is, is immortalized going to be immortalized in the field because we found the first new mechanism for the treatment of depression in 62 years. The first new mechanism approved by the FDA for the treatment of depression. And I'll come back to another mechanism called rexanolone, which was developed by Sage Pharmaceuticals in a little bit. But this is really Congratulations, right, everybody? Um, it, it's really a very exciting thing and something that we can be very proud of. And the thing to me that's most exciting about ketamine is that we would have never thought that a drug could get people better quickly. I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge challenge, and the dogma was it takes weeks, if not months, to get people feeling better. And, and hopefully they feel better, maybe they won't feel better, and you can't really tell unless you treat for, for a long time. But with ketamine, after a couple of weeks, you can tell whether a person's going to be a responder or not, and a lot of people respond within 24 hours. The ketamine is so exciting in some ways because it grew from a scientific hypothesis, a, a novel scientific hypothesis, which has received um, you know, tremendous support from an exciting new advance in, in, in uh, positron emission tomography. So Sophie Holmes and Irina Estrelis um, have done a wonderful study using a technology in involving PET scans where you can measure the density, something related to the density of synaptic connections in the brain. And when you do that, you find in several areas of the brain involved in the regulation of emotion, that there are actually reduced synapses in the brain. Now, many of you probably already know that something like 90% of the synapses in, in the brain are glutamate synapses. And so the uh, changes in glutamate swamp uh, changes in, in the density of almost all kinds of receptors. One of the very, so this is probably at least in part a reduction in glutamate synapses in the brain. And, and Sophie and, and Irina showed that, that that was related to reductions in patterns of communication in the brain that you could measure with MRI. So, so why is this view of depression as a reduction in connections in the brain 
so kind of transformative? And how does it relate to ketamine? It comes from, from a, a groundbreaking study from Ron Duman and George Agajanian and their colleagues that showed when you, that, that these, these arrows represent places of dendritic spines, which is places where the glutamate synapses are made. And that if you stress an animal for a long period of time and they look depressed, the richness of those synaptic connections goes down. But if you give a single dose of ketamine, those synaptic connections regrow very quickly. And those new synapses, as Alex Kwan has shown very elegantly, last about as long as the antidepressant effects of ketamine. So the notion of that, that there's a pathology of depression in glutamate synaptic connections of the brain, and that there's a corrective treatment for that pathology um, is, is a very exciting hypothesis and supported by an elegant study that was led by Chadi Abdullah in, in collaboration with our friends at Mount Sinai, Dennis Charney, James Murrow, and others that show, again, reduced reductions, like in, in, in the earlier study, reductions in the functional communication of the brain in depression, and remarkably, within 24 hours of the first dose of ketamine, a correction of that deficit in cortical communication. So things are changing. In, t in 10 years, the, c the, the discourse about the biology and the treatment of mental illness is, has been transformed. And that paralleled with the, with the development of an effective new treatment is just extremely exciting. This is another uh, breakthrough. And I just want to highlight that Yale, we have our fingers in everything. So, so the other drug is a drug called brexanolone, which is a drug by Sage Pharmaceuticals. And the medical director of Sage Pharmaceuticals is Steve Keynes, who did his residency at Yale and, and then went to the pharmaceutical industry. This is a remarkable drug. It's the first treatment targeting postpartum depression. It's a very expensive drug. But, um, but you know, it's, it's very exciting because it, it targets a, another action. So another part of the transformation of the last 10 years is that genetics, believe it or not, is beginning to mean something. You can take almost all genetics work in psychiatry from before about 2012, 2010, um, almost all of it, and throw it away. It's almost as if the field has just begun. And so I, I want to illustrate how work at Yale is part of this kind of transformative moment where genetics starts to tell us things that are really interesting. So a study uh, led by uh, Joel Galanter and Marie Steen um, and involving the use of something called the Million Veteran Program. Now, they don't yet have all the data on all million veterans, but they are going to have data eventually on a million veterans. And, um, and, they're, and they have, for the first time, um, have replicable genome-wide significance for genetic findings for post-traumatic stress disorder. So post-traumatic stress disorder, lots of genetic studies throw them all away. And this is the, really, the, in some ways, the first actionable uh, study on the genetics of PTSD in 150,000 people. And lots of, uh, you know, these are the interesting targets that came up. And I'm just going to focus on one of the targets it's a locus. It's not. We don't know that the gene is is this uh, uh, corticotropin releasing factor receptor one, but that's where the linkage pink is, and that's a really interesting study because of the multidisciplinary nature of of research at Yale. So that you can have a finding from your genome, and then you can go and work with someone like Matt Dragenti and and Ron Duman. And you can analyze the expression of that gene in the postmortem brain tissue, showing an upregulation of that same expression of that same gene in postmortem tissue in people with PTSD. And we can go back and look at our older data from cerebral spinal fluid, a study from, by, led by Doug Bremner, showing upregulation of the 
substance made in the brain, corticotropin releasing factor. So you have an, an increase in the, you have a gene variation, you have an increase in the expression of the receptor in the brain, and you have an increased level of the, of the protein in your CSF. That has an obvious implication for treatment, which is that if you could block CRF receptor one, you should be able to treat the symptoms of PTSD. And I'm very pleased to say that our journal, Biological Psychiatry, <laughs> published the first trial, which says it, it doesn't work. <laughs> but, but, uh, but there is an interesting follow-along to that observation. Um, and that is, and I'm going to cut to the chase, that even though the drug doesn't reduce the symptoms of PTSD, what it does do, what it does, you don't have to say do, that's implicit, what it does is to, um, what it does is to reduce the retention of fear over time. So, uh, so it, it affects a phenotype, a part of the profile of the symptoms of PTSD, even though it's not an effective treatment. And what we do with that, I don't think any of us know, but it's interesting to know that, that our ideas about diagnosis and our ideas of treatment are evolving and focusing more on the traits that we may be able to follow from genes to biology to treatment, and maybe moving away from thinking about treatments as treating all of the symptoms for all the entire disorder all of the time. Perhaps the most transformative treatment um, is something that you might argue is not a psychiatric treatment at all, but really a neurology treatment. But when you think about going from a, a gene to a treatment, we all wonder if there's going to be an er era when we have gene therapy, where we are giving the product, missing products of genes or correcting the expression of genes in the brain. And this has happened for the first time in a, a terrible, terrible neurologic disorder called spinal muscular at atrophy. This is one of those disorders where a child is born, they move around, they play around, and then they, they just fall apart. And um, lethal, a lethal disorder. And they now have a, a uh, they can, they, have, they know what the gene abnormality is, they can introduce the gene with a virus, and, um, and, and the, uh, that takes hold, and it, alleviates the symptoms of the disorder substantially. So it's a really an amazing, incredible breakthrough. It's the first time we've ever had this um, uh, gene therapy in, for a, a central nervous system disorder. It's got one tiny little drawback. It costs $2 million a treatment. So. So how much is a life worth? It's really tough, right? Really tough. And this is just illustrates the challenges that some of the, one of the challenges that we're going to face, which is we're going to end up being in a place where the technology and the investment in, in developing more and more personalized treatments makes the economic model more and more challenging. And what we, how we handle that as a society is, is going to be really, really interesting. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the department. So here we, here's Yale, Handsome Dan, and, and as I was showing someone Handsome Dan, and I mentioned that I was thinking that, that I would use Handsome Dan in my talk, and someone said to me, you know, you know that is, that's an incredibly sexist thing to do, uh, because Handsome Dan is a male dog, and, and the Department of Psychiatry is trying to show how diverse you are. You're, you're taking a step backwards. And, and I just want to share my response to that criticism. Handsome Dan the 12th is actually a female dog. <laughs> uh, and my favorite, my favorite thing about Handsome Dan the 12th are the words that they use to describe her. Pugnacious, stubborn, lovable. I mean, these are just like the Department of Psychiatry. So <laughs> from now on, hands, handsome, handsome Dan the 12th is going to be the, be the symbol of the Department of Psychiatry. Um, and we are pugnacious, and we are lovable. And because of that, we were once again able to overturn uh, the governor's threatened cut of 
to the funding of the Connecticut Mental Health Center. This, this was a team effort, people writing in, people testifying, people um, uh, speaking to their Congress, uh, congressional representatives, and we overturned this. So, so thank you, all of you. We, this is a just example of, 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 of advocacy and action. If we don't advocate for ourselves, nobody else will. Um, and we are very fortunate to, to enjoy the support of, of the Connecticut legislature in repeatedly overturning this. Sadly, I suspect we'll do this again next year. So, uh, you know, listen for updates in the fall as, as we once again take this on. As I look back over the, over, the, over the last 10 years, nothing is more exciting than our celebration of now 103 years of medicine, women in medicine in the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, it was a wonderful year-long celebration, um, and I think it really raised our uh, consciousness about, about the, the challenges uh, of uh, women face in, in, on the faculty in the department, the opportunities to take advantage of the talent that, and, and drive and, and uh, that, that, uh, that women bring to our department. And, and then, uh, you know, this issue, which is that, that uh, a year after our celebration of, of, uh, of the role of women in our department, uh, you know, it, a celebration is not a cure. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we are, we are in this uh, issue of uh, harassment and uh, respect uh, for the long run, and we will we will stay in, uh, stay in it. Those of you who were at the State of the Department last year w will remember that that people provided us with uh, examples of of what they had to deal with in their work. This is a, a something that a woman in our department said. I had to walk by a gentleman's office several times a day. I was typically greeted with comments such as, "There's my sunshine, hi, pretty lady, hi there, hot stuff." When I was coughing, he stood in my doorway and said he was hoping he'd need to perform mouth to mouth on me. I mean, who needs this, right? This is unacceptable. It's not the kind of community that we want to have, and yet we will. There will be uh, a continued. Uh, uh, there will be continued lapses and transgressions and. We need to uh, hold the line in our community uh, uh, against this kind of harassment and all kinds of harassment for all the ways in which we, uh, the unique uh, qualities, anything that makes us unique as individuals is something that somebody might, might, um, might harp on and, and uh, uh, if we want to be um, a real community, we need to stop that. And we need to recognize the vulnerabilities, which is that, that um, so, for example, for, for the issues of, of male and female promotion in the faculty, it turns out that both male and female faculty are vulnerable to rating female candidates more harshly and to recommend lower salaries. In other words, it was the shocking part is not that male uh, faculty would engage in this, but that it's just we are all members of the culture that we live in and we can't escape that. But Males evaluate gender bias research as more negatively and are less likely to accept the results. In other words, right? In, in other words, when we realize that it's happening, men have a harder time responding to it because it evokes a challenge to privilege, a challenge to their personal um, uh, view of the world, and and and. Uh, um, and this is true about males and females. I could say it about race. I could say it about LGBT, L, LGBTQ. I could say, say this about uh, ethnicity. I could say this about any characteristic that differentiates us as a community. And we have to be, we have to be constantly um, uh, uh, on guard that when somebody in our community is being uh, treated unfairly and that challenges our personal privileges that that will engender in us a, a resistance to hearing the news. The only way we can be a community is to hear it. We can't, al we can't always accept all the conclusions that people bring to us, but we have to hear it and we have to wrestle with it. How are we doing in terms of underrepresented minorities in the department? In 2009, there were three URM associate professors. Now there are 12. 
Uh, 11 out of the 12 are clinician educators, and we have one uh, URM faculty in the investigator track, um, and we want to do better, and we will do better. But the change over two years will be slow, but the change over 10 years will be uh, more significant. We also, we also struggle with being a part of a community. And in the New Haven community, we had a terrible shooting of, of a man and a woman in a car. The police thought that they were involved in a crime. And then shortly after that, someone set a fire in the mosque in New Haven. And so we had a town hall uh, with, uh, with our staff and faculty to discuss these events. Um, and we heard a lot. We heard a lot from the attendees about the deep personal impact of these events, local, the national context, and even international violence, particularly violence targeting um, particular groups. Um, and there was an interest in having more discussions, more granular, at, at gran more granular level discussions within the workplace, in sites of work, in, within our institutions, and more broadly within the department when terrible things like that happen. The feeling of, uh, that these events make people feel out, uh, disconnected from their colleagues or from the workplace, and, and that if we don't talk about them, if we don't acknowledge them, then it'll be hard for people to feel involved. Plus, a, the, one of the questions that came up, and I, for which I don't have an answer, but I just raise it today, is how do we better engage the communities that we serve when they're dealing with these issues or when we're doing a research study th to, deal, uh, to address the feeling that can sometimes arise uh, uh, in our surrounding communities that when we are doing research to alleviate the burden of mental illness that we are also at, in some way exploiting their participation, exploiting them. And, and we don't want that us versus them dynamic uh, to, to grow and to fester. And so we, it would be helpful to think about how we can better engage the community that we serve. All right. So a little bit of good news. Um, you guys are great. You're in the, like in the top few departments of psychiatry and psychology in the world. And one of the things that I particularly like about our community is that we're the only university in the world where our psychology, our psychiatry, and our neuroscience departments are, are all so high rated. There, there are other universities that have two of those three, but we're the only one that's so good in, in all of those areas. And uh, the work that we do uh, uses a lot of resource. So we have, um, uh, uh, we have now over $70 million in annual direct costs from NIH, more grants funding from the VA, the Department of Defense, and other funding sources. Um, and 41 faculty in our department have three or more grants. So I just, want, I just wanted to say this as chair because everyone in our department who uh, uh, has three grants rightfully believes that they are uniquely uh, <laughs> Uh, accomplished and uniquely deserves an increase and a commensurate increase in, in their salary. Uh, of which I, I completely support this. But I just want to let all of you know that one of the, one of the, one of the reasons, uh, I, don't, I don't want to put it this way, but I'll put it this way for, to be funny, haha, -ha, that, 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 one of the reasons people stick around for the Yale salary is because you're in a place where 41 other people have three grants too. That this is a remarkable community of people who are incredibly accomplished and, and that generates a lot of good things. In 2009, we were number two um, in, in NIH funding. Uh, we were about uh, 10 million, a little bit almost uh, not quite 10 million less than uh, the University of Pittsburgh, and about 10 million more than UCSD. Between 2009 and 2019, we are again number two, although, as you know, there were years when we were number one. <laughs> but this, the wonderful part of data is 
you can always focus on the part that you think is most interesting. <laughs> and and the, the part that I think is most interesting is the, is the differential between 2009 and, and 2019. In other words, University of Pittsburgh in that time increased their funding by 10 million, mostly in the last year, interestingly enough. We, on the other hand, increased our funding by almost 20 million. And so um, that, uh, you know, the disparity with Pittsburgh has mostly gone away in, 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 the other, in some years we've, we've obviously surpassed them. So we are really, not only are, do, are we generating a lot of, uh, of the fuel for research, these grants, but the community of research that's generating this fuel is growing and expanding. This isn't one person with $20 million more grants they have now than in 2009. This is a whole community, the 41 people, the 150 people who are engaged in research or more in the department. So, so this is a lot to be proud of. There's a lot to be proud of over the last 10 years in education. In 2010, psychiatry was the most popular specialty for Yale medical, uh, medical students. I suspect that may happen again someday. Um, that uh, in 2011, we recruited one uh, quarter of, one fifth, one quarter of the nation's MD, PhDs. In 2012, we had 800 applicants for our 16 spots. We thought that was amazing. And, but by 2015, we had about 1,300 applications for those same spots. Um, NNCI, uh, very strongly associated with Yale because of David Ross, this initiative to improve uh, neuroscience education for psychiatrists. Um, and then we have great uh, fellowships in public psychiatry, Hispanic mental health, interventional psychiatry, and lots of new things. One of the most transformative moments for me was actually going to a Reb Psych conference. And there was a guy, Michael Denzel Smith, who gave a wonderful talk and led a great discussion. But, but ask the very pr provocative question, what are you willing to get up, give up, to get the, get the kind of community that you want to have in the end? And so for me, this was very uh, tied up to the debate, very active debate and discussion about what do we do with, with uh, the way in which the department portrays itself. And, and the department portrays itself in many different ways. Uh, one of the ways is th was the paintings that we had in the conference room and which are continuing to evolve. Um, and, uh, 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 and, and we, we took down the paintings. We're still thinking about how to, to expand. And we put up the pictures of the community in the hallway and, and we're continuing that process of, of self-reflection as a department and hope to, um, uh, to have a more representative a depiction of what we're doing. We're building our community in many ways through the thinking about salary, equity, diversity. Uh, Cindy Crusto playing a, an incredibly important role there. Um, uh, in salaries, I want to thank our staff, um, at, led by Steve Gentile, who's done a, been doing a wonderful job. And in engagement through so many vehicles that, that the dean has uh, contributed. I'd like to just talk now briefly about honors and transition. Ismini Petrakis and Sandy Springer have their incredible VA study. We now have the VA Center on Homelessness led by Jack Sy at the VA. Uh, Chris Pittenger is the uh, uh, um, uh, leader now of the Faculty Advisory Council at the chair, uh, which is a really important role. We have a wonderful collaboration with Silver Hill Hospital and Andrew Gerber. An Andrew, I don't know if everybody knows you. If you wouldn't mind just raising your hand. Thank you. That's his hand. Uh, <laughs> it's been a wonderful collaboration between uh, Yale New Haven, Yale School of Medicine, and, and Silver Hill Hospital in the Stewart, the Stewart House, which is, uh, which is a thriving program for impaired executives. And we've begun considering uh, wor working towards a new psychiatric hospital. Um, this has been a, a wonderful, an, an outgrowth of the really wonderful collaboration that we have uh, developed, um, which I uh, in, uh, give tremendous credit to Michael Holmes with support from both Marna Borgstrom and Rick DeQuilla 
um, and the great job that Frank Fortunati has been doing as medical director. We have an incredible team of people working to develop and, and uh, evolve the services at, at Yale Haven Hospital, and, and uh, now we have be begun to think about how to build, you know, raise the money to uh, build a, a replacement. We have a new chair of the Department of Psychology at Yale, Ty Cannon. And Ty is the first clinical psychologist, I think, since Susan's, Susan Nolan Hoeksema's brief uh, tenure as chair of, of, of psychology, someone who is very much invested in the collaboration with our department as we are invested in the collaboration with psychology. This is a big year as we s begin the search for a new dean as Bob Alpern is uh, uh, stepping down. And, um, um, but I, um, I really want to thank Bob for his support of my role as chair and for the department. He's been supportive of everything that we've done um, and uh, we could not have achieved what we have achieved over the last 10 years without his support. Um, this year, friends of, of the two Georges, as we call them, the, I don't think they're tenure, tenors, uh, so I can't say the, the two tenors, but, uh, but uh, we have uh, raised mon money to create, uh, from friends, to create the George Agajanian and George Henniger Distinguished Lecture, and that will begin in the upcoming year. Similarly, Friends of Howard Zanana have raised money to create an uh, endowed lectureship in, in his honor. Uh, Howard, uh, congratulations, well-deserved. I know you're here, there you are. Congratulations, it's a, a, a wonderful honor and we're thrilled to, to, uh, to represent that. There's not time to, to list everybody's honors. Um, I'm not gonna mention everybody's name. You know who you are. This is like the 41 uh, people with three R01s. The, 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 the breadth, the depth of, of accomplishments of, of people getting honored in the department is just, is just incredible. Oh yeah, there's another page. Uh, <laughs> You two are this also incredible breadth and depth and uh, remarkable uh, just a accomplishments of people in the department. Uh, this year at the APA, um, Esperanza Diaz got the Simon Bolivar Award for her contributions in Hispanic mental health and uh, Godfrey Perlson got his mentorship award. These are two very, very prominent national awards. And Al Powers got the Clearman Award, named after Jerry Clearman, who was the one of the first leaders of the Connecticut Mental Health Center, uh, and for and Al Powers got got this very prestigious award. This year, we um, we uh, gave a uh, advocacy award to uh, Judge Stephen Leifman, who's been a real pioneer uh, of of decriminalizing mental illness, and we gave an advocacy award to Garen and Sherry Staglin at the American Psychiatric Award uh, American Psychiatric Association meeting. Garen and Sherry have raised over $290 million for mental health causes, mental health research causes, um, really remarkable people. Last year, we celebrated Carlos Grillo and Nadia Ward uh, stepping up to assume the lead leadership of the psychology internship program. Um, Nadia has just uh, received a remarkable uh, uh, position which she is going to assume at C uh, Clark University um, and uh, uh, where she will be leading an, an endowed institute. She will become an endowed professor and really have an opportunity to expand the impact of the work that she's been doing at Yale. So we are very, very sad to see Nadia leave, but we are thrilled that she will be emerging in such a wonderful way. And I'm also very pleased to announce that Amber Childs will be stepping up. Um, it, I think there's an L on clinica, <laughs> clinic, clinical <laughs> psychiatry. Um, uh, and, that, and that she'll be working with uh, uh, Regita Sinha, who will be co-director of the internship, and Jack Teebs and Dwayne Fian, who, who uh, will maintain their uh, leadership roles in the internship program. I want to especially acknowledge uh, Lorraine Siggins. Uh, Lorraine is uh, stepping down as, uh, as uh, uh, as the, the embodiment of the aspirations of, of, of our department for contributing to the mental health of the Yale um, uh, student community, um, uh, taking the reins from Bob Arnstein and then, and then uh, really having a transformative effect 
uh, on the university health services um, and um, protecting um, Yale undergrad, generations of Yale undergraduates from the negative consequences of their own impulses and their own struggles. <laughs> um, uh, Lorraine, we are deeply indebted to you. I, where are you? There you are. Lorraine, thank you so much for all that you've brought generations of teaching to the department, uh, and we wish you uh, all the best uh, as a professor emeritus. Thank you. This year, we also celebrated the retirement of Steve Southwick. Steve uh, has been uh, just a, a, a gentleman, a scholar, a contributor to how we think about stress and trauma, a leader in the field of post-traumatic stress disorder nationally and internationally. Um, this, this picture that here that, that was taken at, at Steve's retirement celebration um, where uh, he was presented with a tribute that was read into the congressional record uh, about his contributions to PTSD and service to veterans by Senator Blumenthal. Um, uh, recapitulates a picture that was taken in 1990, 1980, yeah, 1989, a picture in, in uh, Moscow, Soviet Union, late Gorbachev, late Gorbachev when the, uh, he looked like a general, he had a really big hat, presented the results of the uh, R Russian or Soviet army uh, analysis of, of their uh, psychiatric casualties of their invasion of Afghanistan where they reported zero cases of post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> uh, it turned out that that was a slightly inaccurate. Uh, so Steve, we, we, we thank you also for your uh, contributions to the department. I, I do want to highlight a, a, a transition a, a passing who, uh, known to many, many people here who, who are in the department, and that's Herb Kleber. Herb received the Distinguished Alumnus Award from the department. He established, really, put substance abuse uh, clinical work and research on the map. He created the APT Foundation uh, and was uh, the deputy, he's another czar, he's a deputy czar for, uh, for, for drug abuse uh, uh, reduction, um, uh, pr then went to Columbia, and he passed uh, quietly on the island of Santorini on vacation uh, during, over the past year, and uh, he was a beloved figure, and, and, and we, we miss him uh, a great deal. Even more tragically, though, this year was the loss of Jeremy Richmond. So Jeremy and, and his wife, Jennifer Hensel, um, lost their daughter at the Sandy Hook tragedy, the shooting. And, and Jeremy and Jennifer created a foundation called the Aviella Foundation to try to understand and end this kind of horrible violence, to understand the causes of violence and, and to try to end it. And that foundation, the Avi Aviella Foundation, still goes on under Jennifer's leadership. But tragically, this year, Jeremy took his own life. Terrible, and you know, so add tragedy upon tragedy, and uh, 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 you know, we we uh, we uh, are just so sad about about the lingering impact of of uh, their daughter's death, and and very hopeful for Jennifer as she um, uh, uh, continues the work that she and uh, Jeremy uh, developed. So, summing up. Always remember and never forget that you are part of a very, very special community and that it's a community of values where everyone is welcomed and respected and where everybody contributes and everybody has access to whatever the opportunities are that, that we can create and that everyone is treated fairly or at least as fairly as we can and that everybody is held up to a very high standard of professionalism, that we have high expectations for excellence from everybody, and, and that this is a culture of innovation where we don't accept things as the way they are, but question and change them and have an impact on the world. So in closing, thank you for the past 10 years which have been really wonderful and I look forward to working with each one of you 
uh, on, the, on the work that lies ahead. And uh, please don't forget to stay for the picture. So thank you very much.